Beside the rough and unknown sea, who would leave Asia, Africa or Italy and go to Germania with its rough landscape, bad climate and sad sight? With these words, the Roman writer Tacitus described Germania, the land of the people who, to the dismay of many a Roman general and emperor, were never fully subdued by the might of Rome. As a result, Germania and its people were demonized and mysticized, often being simply put away as warmongering savages in a depressing land of endless forests and marshes. But what do we really know about these people? who Tacitus described as Rome's greatest adversary, even greater than the Gauls, Carthaginians and even the feared Parthians. How did they live? Who was in charge? And what did they fight for? In this video, I'll give you an overview of Germanic society. This video is sponsored by Wondrium, the premier entertaining and educational video subscription service that enriches your life with approachable content. Wondrium is where you find the answer to everything you've ever wondered about and some things you've never imagined you would wonder about. Their collection of short and long form videos, tutorials, how-tos and documentaries are researched in detail, entertaining and presented by experts. In a nutshell, Wondrium is the place for minds that wonder. It is the place for you. We always want to keep developing ourselves and we found out that Wondrium is the perfect place to do so. At Wondrium, we can challenge ourselves to learn even more about certain topics because no matter your interest, Wondrium has it all. Especially for us history nerds, Wondrium is the place to be. For example, we truly enjoyed the series History's Great Military Blunders and the lessons that they teach. In this documentary, I learned that in the Battle of Adwa in 1896, the Ethiopians were attacked by the Italians during the colonization era and that they were the first native people to effectively defeat an imperial power. This kind of information was totally unknown to me. If you've ever wondered about anything, Wondrium is the place for you. And they're giving viewers a great offer, a free trial. Don't miss out and subscribe now. Please visit wonderium.com slash Imperium Romanum or click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. So, first and foremost, what is Germania? Or pronounced better, Germania. In Latin, Germania means the land of the Germani, such as Gallia is the land of the Galli, the Gauls. According to Tacitus, the Germani were an old tribe that first crossed the river Rhine and settled on this side of the Rhine to later become known under a different name. Whether these are accurate or not is questionable. Nonetheless, what is clear is that the name must have been in use by the Gauls and from there got adopted by Julius Caesar during his Gallic Wars. Through his books, the word spread into the Roman mainstream. So the word Germanic, as a common denominator for a large array of different peoples, is a Roman invention and in no way how these peoples would have referred to themselves. Julius Caesar is also the first Roman to give some description of these people and their land. Caesar's book though, was a clear piece of propaganda, meant to justify his violence in Gaul, towards both Gauls and Germanic immigrants. No wonder his description of the Germanic people is utterly simplistic, portraying them as wild men, who lived solely off of hunting and plundering, being incapable of civilization and presenting nothing but a threat to Rome. His most defining and lasting characteristic of the Germanic people, however, was that they lived on the other side of the river Rhine, opposite of the Gauls. The Rhine has ever since been taken as the western border of the lands of the Germanic peoples. But this needs to be taken with a large grain of salt, as there is no proof of significantly different cultures on opposite sides of the river, at least in the close proximity of the river. What seems more likely is that the border wasn't as black and white, but more gradient, with peoples and cultures mixing and bingling with the neighbors. That is not to say there was no such thing as Germanic culture, though. 
What binds the Germanic people together, in our modern eyes at least, is for a large part their own language family, but also their religion and lifestyle, being different from that of the Gauls for example. Where the Gauls were no stranger to living in big cities, the Germans lived scattered across the lands, often in tiny villages of just a handful of farmsteads. These villages formed self-sufficient communities in which animal husbandry and agriculture were the main livelihoods. They produced or traded grain, animal hides, wood, textiles, and in coastal areas, salt. Many Germanic communities were also highly skilled in producing metal objects, such as weapons and tools. The image of a total lack of civilization is clearly unjustified. Although it is true their communities were significantly less complex and smaller in scale than that of the other non-Roman or Greek societies. With Germania being made up of many small and independent communities, there was no single higher authority to mingle in each community's internal affairs. So it was the people themselves that held all political power. That is to say, they decided how they were to be governed and by whom. Most common would be for the people to choose a temporary or permanent single leader, call him a chieftain or a king, or to form a council consisting of multiple people. Whatever form materialized, the people who were put in charge depended on the support of the common people, because without any higher authority, they were the foundation of and checked on their power. This resulted in the social hierarchy developing in a very uncomplicated and natural way. Whomever received the most support got to power. Men with strong charisma and a well-reputed family name were certainly off to a great start in their bid for power. But really, there was no one decisive factor in the political arena. All manner of skills and traits may have been sought after in a leader, depending on the local situation. For example, communities often confronted with war would look for someone who knows best how to keep them safe, either with leadership and skill in battle, or with strong connections to other tribes or skills in negotiating. For communities where war was less common, the people might seek someone to best stimulate their economy and their prosperity, perhaps a savvy businessman with a strong trading network. In a small community, such a direct democratic system would be practical and fair, as having all people cast their vote wouldn't have been too difficult or too much involvement to ask for. And without any outside authority to take into account, it would also be the most natural form of governing, as the common people, in their numbers, hold the power to overthrow any unwanted ruler. And so, their will be done. Imagine a couple of typical tiny Germanic villages. Because of their proximity to one another, the people move around freely and frequently, for trade and other business, for visiting family and friends, and perhaps for regional feasts and religious events. As a result, the people of such neighboring villages would naturally grow towards each other and form some sort of a community, meaning their social, economic and eventually their political lives would become intertwined. Some of those made up communities would formally organize themselves into a single political entity. In this example, the people decide to form a council made up of the most important members of each village. Either way, once their livelihood and overall prosperity had come to depend in large part on each other, forming a military alliance would be the inevitable next step for such a collection of villages. Of course, such a group would not live completely isolated. In all directions were similar communities to be found. And so, in a similar manner, the process of expansion and forging alliances would continue and spread out across the land. Over time, this created grand alliances, together making for thousands or even tens of thousands of people. These are what we refer to as tribes. At this level of magnitude, direct democracy as a form for daily governance becomes highly impractical. First of all, because organizing a vote for thousands of people spread out over a vast area would be an incredible hassle to organize effectively. And second of all, because the people would have little clue about the bigger topics that played at such a scale, or the political candidates that ran for office. So instead of each individual member doing the voting himself, what happens naturally as communities grow bigger, is that people put forward representatives, someone whose job it is to concern himself with all the topics of governing, 
and therein represent his people. These representatives could be the same people that already had conquered the position of highest authority within their respective community, either as a single ruler or as part of a council of rulers. The tribal council was in charge of the day-to-day -day management of the tribe. They decided directly and exclusively on all topics of minor importance, like arranging marriages between important families and solving local disputes, for example. The topics of greater importance were not decided on by this council of leading men, but instead by the tribal assembly. The tribal assembly consisted of all arms-bearing men, but excluding slaves and freed slaves. According to Tacitus, this assembly got together on fixed days, either at noon or at full moon, as in Germanic religion, these were the most auspicious moments. He writes how the people didn't all arrive at the location of the assembly on the same day, but instead over the course of two or three days, blaming their alleged free spirit for not showing up on the agreed day and time. The more likely reason is probably that these assemblies required of hundreds if not thousands of men to travel great distances across a land of dirt roads and without proper navigation. Delays are to be expected. Once a sufficient representation of the armed branch of the tribe was deemed present, the meeting began and all people were set down. Then, the members of the tribal council would address the issues on the agenda for that meeting. Approval by the crowd was shown by putting their spears up in the air, says Tacitus. Likely, this went hand in hand with cheering, so that the support for a speaker could either be accurately measured by counting the spears, or roughly estimated by the volume of the reaction of the crowd. It's a remarkable thing, this assembly, that shows the prominent role of democracy in Germanic society, especially considering the fact that it would have been quite the effort to gather so many men. Such gatherings, therefore, would only make sense for the most important of decisions, like going to war, or perhaps merging or joining up with other tribes. This, tribes grouping up, makes for the final stage of upscaling in ancient Germanic society. When tribes join forces in a permanent way, such a group of different tribes can be called a confederation. The Suebi are an example of such, who are known to us through Roman literature. Next to their own characteristic hairstyle, the Suebian knot, they are known for being the biggest confederation of Germanic tribes, in the first century AD consisting of no less than 14 tribes. Unlike the picture that is often painted to us by modern movies and series, Germanic society was not all peace and harmony up until the arrival of the Romans. Hostility between neighboring tribes would have been all too common, but, like for many ancient societies, war though was not inherently thought of as a bad thing. Instead, war was an inextricable part of life and surrounded by great cultural significance. To men, warfare was even part of growing up. As part of the ritual of coming of age, all young men were at one point in their teen years presented to the tribal council. The tribal council would then judge of the boy and either approve or disapprove of his overall readiness for becoming a warrior. If the council approved of the young man, he was given his own shield and spear right then and there. The shield and spear are thus symbol for their maturity, like the wearing of the toga is for Roman young men, so says Tacitus. After that, a Germanic youth was considered an adult and could now join in the military efforts of the tribe. Because there was no such thing as a professional standing army in Germanic society, warriors had to be incentivized to fight. Obviously, the most compelling reason for taking up arms was out of self-defense. But for less urgent calls to battle, like small-scale tactical operations, part of a bigger plan, more incentives were needed. Luckily, young men didn't need that strong of an incentive since they were eager to gain some experience in combat and prove their worth. For them, a small pay would suffice. In such small-scale operations, these warriors could gain their pay through sharing in the spoils of war, be that looted corpses or plundered lands and villages. Having tasted battle and shared in the spoils of war, they could then decide to become a professional soldier, or at least the Germanic equivalent of it. For this, they would turn to the commander of such military operations, the war leader, called a dux in Latin. He was the highest ranking man in charge of the troops in times of war, 
someone from the tribal council who was elected by the tribal assembly. Young men seeking honor and adventure would flock around such war leaders, even coming from other tribes, and forming the war leader's personal retinue of warriors, if he allowed them to. These warriors were his personal warband and the first in line to partake in raids and other military operations. For the warriors, it was an honor to be part of the retinue of an esteemed war leader. And for the war leader, it was a direct way of boasting his power. The larger his retinue, and the more fearsome its members, the more powerful he was. The position of war leader, though, was meant to be temporary, similarly to the appointment of a dictator in Roman society. It was a position created for a specific purpose, namely leadership in times of war. Without war, the position was to be cancelled. The inherent problem with such immensely powerful positions, though, is that power corrupts and people will do whatever it takes to maintain their power. And no better way to maintain power than to have your own personal army, the ultimate ingredient for tyranny. So, inevitably, certain war leaders would try to maintain their personal retinue of warriors outside of war as well, spoiling them with gifts, organizing feasts, and perhaps giving away land or influential positions within the tribe, whatever was within their power to keep them satisfied. Sooner or later, though, such treats ran out, and military action was required to both fill the war leader's own coffers and provide purpose for his warriors. The solution was to either keep a military conflict from ending or outright create a new one. In this way, war leaders catered to their own and other war leaders' needs, creating a circle of violence that was kept in play by war leaders across different tribes. Perhaps that's the best way to sum up evolution and dynamics in Germanic society. It was war that powered change. What started out initially as small and independent, relatively peaceful and democratic societies, over time turned into ever bigger, more martial and autocratic societies. On a smaller scale, it was war that made young warriors move around in search of military opportunity and the best employer therein. In turn, power-hungry war leaders played into this phenomenon by trying to attract such warriors, possibly resulting in the prolongation and creation of military conflicts. On a bigger scale, it was wars that moved individual communities to form tribes for either defensive or offensive purposes. And exactly the same thing happened with the formation of confederations. The size of the threat or ambition determined the scale of cooperation. In other words, ultimately, a society without a central higher authority has a habit of turning into a free-for-all, where the law of the strongest prevails.